While we've got some pretty great educated guesses as to what Mars is really like to live on, thanks to the various Mars landers and all of the information that they've sent back to Earth, there will still be an element of stepping into the unknown for the first humans that might eventually reach our reddest neighbour. We might find untold wonders beneath the surface of the planet that challenge our very conception of science up until this point. We probably won't, but we might. Coming to PlayStation 4, Xbox One and PC on the 15th of March, which is just a freshly announced release date, Hamemont Games' Surviving Mars is all about creating a colony on Mars in a relatively realistic fashion, but they're sprinkling the game with a few little moments of trademark humour that they showed through their time developing the Tropico series. There's mysterious things that might start happening and weird wonders to discover as your colony grows, potentially threatening the populace or alternatively giving you a fantastic opportunity to thrive. The choices you make when starting your colony can have a deep impact on how the game unfolds. Choose the USA, China or Space Y as a sponsor. I'm actually curious where they got the Space Y idea from. It might be some kind of real world reference but I just can't figure out what it's from. Anyway, pick any of those three and you will be flush with cash, having multiple rockets and plenty of resources to get going. Add a rocket scientist, a hydro engineer or an ecologist to command the expedition and they'll bring meaningful improvements to what you can manage to achieve on the planet as you first land. Alternatively, you can do what I did, much to the initial dismay of Hamemont's Gabriel Dobrev, and you can choose the Church of the New Ark and have them led by an oligarch. This is basically as close as I could get to coming up with Scientologists in space. So I had fewer rockets, but all of my colonists would now come with the religious trait, and the birth rate would be doubled as a consequence, as they seek to populate the planet like a bunch of evangelical bunny rabbits. With this kind of disadvantage and picking from various landing sites around Mars, this gave me a difficulty bonus of somewhere between 180 and 300%. So my couple of hours with the game definitely had more of a survival slant to them than the others playing, so it was pretty good to have Gabriel there alongside me to guide my hand in setting out the foundations for my colony. The first rocket can land with whatever you want it to contain, really, but you won't have any people on board. Instead, it's the job of some seriously adorable drones to do the initial heavy lifting, setting up the water supply, energy, and other resource gathering operations in order to give the colony an air of self-sustainability. Also, air. Air is quite important as well. Especially because I couldn't just throw resources at the problems before me, I had to get to work building a compact starting base around my drone hub, with solar panels tightly packed together, a moisture evaporator to suck in what little moisture there was from the atmosphere right next to a fuel refinery so that I could turn that moisture into fuel for my rocket to send it home and get a second wave of supplies. All of these things then had to be connected with pipes and electrical cables, giving this game's colonies a rather distinct look and feel to them that goes far beyond being SimCity in space. The game actually plays really quite well on PlayStation 4, with the controls being fairly easy to pick up and play with. There's still a few quirks to navigating some of the menus and selecting certain options that Hamemont are still working to iron out, but getting access to the quick building menu or manually overriding a drone's controls becomes fairly intuitive after a while. One thing I will say is that playing on a TV right in front of me, the UI felt fine, but now that I look back at the footage, I think it's probably quite a bit too small for TV at a distance. Hopefully that's something that Hamemont can polish off in the next couple of months. On a number of occasions I found myself on the limit of what I had available to me, so first it was the need to build a battery to keep buildings running overnight when there's obviously nothing that solar panels can do, and even then I had to turn things off selectively once I had built the concrete extractor which was sucking up a lot of resources. Thankfully, you can turn things on and off based on shifts and have a night shift where you can just shut things down automatically. Then it was trying to figure out what I could afford to fit onto the rocket as it returned from Earth with supplies and make the best use of the available space, especially since I only had two rockets to use and not a lot of money. 
One brilliant moment came right at the end of my session as we'd scanned the surrounding area and found water that I could drill for, meaning that I didn't have to rely on the evaporators. Again, that would then save electricity, so this is quite an important thing to try and get. The only problem was that it was well out of range of the drone hub that I had, and so we had to come up with an elaborate plan to send the RC transport over to a good spot, drop off the necessary supplies for a drone hub, solar panel and short cable, so it was a self-contained little unit, then manually take a freshly charged drone out of range of the first drone hub that I'd built, and repeatedly override its automatic programming in order to force it to build this second hub. That hub and the new drones that spawned out of it it could then make the new pipelines and drill for water. It was this fantastic little success story to end the session with. By that point I'd already placed and built a dome in which my first few colonists could live. You have a degree of control over who embarks on the voyage to Mars as you can filter a pool of volunteers by age, specialties and personality traits. Of course everybody on this list would be strongly religious and anti-contraception. But in keeping with my dumb starting choices, I then decided to filter it for sexy gamer nerds on top of this. I actually managed to come remarkably close to finding one actually. However, at the start of the game, the more important thing to focus on is their professional specialization, such as science, engineering, botany, and so on. And you need to decide what kinds of people are going to serve your burgeoning colony the best. You can worry about how the hypochondriacs are going to interact with the hippies and the party animals later on. With self-sustainability in mind, you really want to grow your own food and start researching so that you can eventually have something worth selling back to Earth and create this self-sustaining system. Fascinatingly, the tech tree is partially randomized, and though you'll eventually unlock all of the technologies in most categories, the breakthrough category will only feature a third of the breakthroughs in the game. This emphasizes the potential new discoveries that having human life on Mars can bring. One example that Gabrielle gave me was that seniors would still be able to work and have children, making them remain a perfectly valid option for colonization in the future. That kind of ties in a roundabout sort of way into the newly announced mysteries, with everything from weird cube-like things to floating bubbles and confounding invisible afflictions. But sadly, I didn't get to see this. I was so busy coming up with ways to just get my colony sort of working that even though I had a research vehicle later on to venture out and scan all of the meteor impact sites and points of interest, I didn't get to see a single one of these 60s sci-fi inspired mysteries. Thankfully, if you don't want to see anything out of the ordinary here, you can always turn them off before you start playing. Even without the mysteries, Surviving Mars has been an intriguing proposition for me since it was first announced. Taking a more survivalist approach to this extraterrestrial colonization and borrowing from what modern day thinking on how that might pan out is a fascinating one, and it makes for a city builder that has its own unique flavor. It might take decades or even centuries for the first human to reach Mars, if we ever do in fact, but come the middle of March, we can all pretend like we're there already, I think. Thanks for checking out this video, and we've also got our written preview up on the sixthaxis.com. We also hope to have plenty more of Surviving Mars as it gets close to release in March, so that's not too far away, and we will definitely be following up on this video. So, in order to make sure that you see that, please do like, subscribe, and check out the rest of our channel. Hopefully, we will see you again soon. Goodbye!